Welcome to another edition of uh, another episode of New Wine and Court. Uh, I'm Matt, that's Phil, and that's Tony down below. And hey, we're excited to be here once again uh, discussing uh, the, the concepts and the ideas that we've been talking about uh, for the last couple of weeks, perpetuating Good Friday. And uh, there's been a lot going on this week, uh, what we've been talking about. And with the, the trial that just uh, concluded with uh, Chauvin and um, discussing the life that was tragically taken with George Floyd, then the, the case with Dante Wright that has just uh, come about with the funeral that was yesterday and they were giving um, a Reverend Al, uh, I think it was Reverend Al, was uh, giving the part of the eulogy and was talking about and he was using language very reminiscent of Dr. King, where uh, because uh, uh, Dante was pulled over for, I think, a tired uh, ex ex tags that were expired, uh, the Reverend was talking about how though that America has had this uh, continued expiration date and in, in an expired uh, gift of freedom to the Black community. And if we look a year ago, the tragedy to me, and I think to most, is that we could find this same week a year ago. We could find this same week two years ago, 10 years ago, where uh, there is a trial. And maybe the, the and I don't want to say this is progression because maybe 10 years ago, uh, the, the cops wouldn't have come to trial if uh, a black man was uh, killed. And so maybe some could see that as progression. But is it progress? If the church is continually perpetuating Good Friday, what is the church's response to a week like this? Yeah, good questions, Tony, man. Tony? No, it was Matt that posed that question. My bad. <laughs> it's just that morning, man. It's just that morning. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But um, part of the thing is to realize we're still in the middle of the struggle here. This is um, this has been an ongoing conversation, and a guilty verdict um, for Derek Chauvin is not the end of anything. This is holy, hopefully the beginning of something else, but it's really in the middle of the story. Um, Many people could probably look at this and think this is a moment of celebration that we should be happy um, that we got justice, but I don't see it as justice. I see it as accountability. This has been one check mark in the long history of police brutality against black folk. Um, and this has been just a long time of police not being held accountable for whether it be their mistakes that they make on their job or whether it be the just overtly controlling a situation that leads to someone's death. Um, and a couple other things came to mind as well. Um, there's a concept that happens, um, I could say kind of plays out different ways, but in relationship to when Osama bin Laden was killed um, and there were celebrations happening in Portland at, <laughs> at Pioneer Courthouse Square, people with American flag celebrating. And then the, the question became, should we be celebrating this? Someone died, what, what are we doing here? And I had the same kind of feeling here, guilty verdict. We don't know how long he's gonna be in jail because the sentence hasn't been handed out, but we're gonna have someone that's gonna spend a good percentage of their life in jail. Is that something to be celebrated? At the same token, um, when you have black on black crime in the middle of neighborhoods and you'd have one black body dead and someone lost their life and then someone going to jail for life. And essentially you have two dead people now when it comes to society overall and there's nothing to celebrate in that. So understanding that this is the middle of the struggle and there's still gonna be a lot of sadness connected to this because of our long history. And I mean, outside of this being a change in what history has given us, we still don't know when we're gonna have, when things are going to be different. So, I mean, so this is the begin, the middle of the struggle and that keeps kind of keeps that idea of perpetual Good Friday, you know, this whole thing. So yeah, that's where I start. Yeah, with a um, point of clarification with uh, the right case, I don't know if it was expired car tags, but a part of it also was um, they had said that uh, the police officer pulled him over because of an air freshener on his mm. uh, mirror. And so what we've seen throughout protests is um, people hanging the, the pine tree car air freshener at protests. And I think continually we see um, uh, protests uh, reveal a prophetic symbol of um, what 
the struggle is about. So over the summer of 2020, we saw uh, the wall of moms form in Portland where moms, whether <clears throat> that has its own problems of moms from the suburbs coming out and protecting protesters. Um, you had um, uh, the, the sign saying when George Floyd called for his mom, he called all moms. So you have these, um, acknowledgements, these communal acknowledgements of um, how we either all participate in anti-racism or we are actively participating or passively participating in uh, perpetuating racism. And I think when we look at the cross, when we look at Good Friday, um, we are actively participating in uh, um, submission to the crucifixion or we are actively um, re participating in a rejection of the crucifixion. And this, this plays out um, in so many ways. There's a Duke um, scholar that has done a, a ton of work on um, incarceration. Uh, I think his name is Mark Taylor. He might not be duped, but Mark Taylor. And I think it's this idea that when we look at the cross, um, and this isn't necessarily Dr. Taylor's um, thesis, but this is where I, I've drawn from him is, um, how does the crucifixion um, bleed into all areas of our life? And so in this case with Derek Chauvin, like if we are rejoicing that he, is going to spend the next 40 to 60 years in prison, that shows that we still don't understand what justice is because we think it's just retribution. And two, that still does not prevent um, uh, the murders and the taking of black lives. Um, justice is when uh, black lives are no longer um, taken because of police brutality. And so the cross confronts all of this because on the cross, there is a victim of retributive justice. Now we just have to reconcile is retribution um, a part of God's uh, plan for restoration and reconciliation. I, I think the cross confronts us with um, how we have a proclivity for victimizing somebody who is uh, a transgressor. Um, and, and so however we lean into Good Friday, I think um, however we continue to perpetuate Good Friday, I think the cross has to confront all of our notions of what justice is. Um, because I think if we are happy that Derek Chauvin is quote unquote getting his just desserts, uh, we're missing the point that man, George Floyd's life was lost and two, um, uh, we are in some ways rejoicing at somebody else's suffering. And that shows more the, uh, the state of our hearts and, and the warped sense of justice that we have. Absolutely, Tony. And that, 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 yeah, that's what I was trying to get at too. It's, um, we do have a warped sense of justice where we think that if I get my get back, then things are okay. And it's like, well, no, we, we have so much more issues here. At the same time, the issues aren't localized to just policing. Um, yes, there is a problem there, but it's not localized there. And we make policing, we kind of identify the systemic nature of the issues through policing because through the idea of accountability. I mean, all of us have jobs. We make a mistake on our jobs we're liable to lose our jobs. We're held accountable for the mistakes we make on our jobs. But when it comes to policing, if you use a particular kind of language, if you uh, if you um, demonstrate a particular kind of threat, then make a mistake on your job, doing something that's stepping beyond the bounds of your job becomes A-OK. -okay. And that becomes the systematic issue of it, where this is what's built into this pie, <laughs> is, that, is that you can say, I mean, thinking of, I mean, it was brought up a lot this week, um, the original statement from the Minneapolis Police Department, right, where they said, hey, someone had an interaction police, police, subsequently they died, you know, and, and, and there was no idea that when we see the video, we're like, wait, this is something else entirely. 
But that's the same kind of thing that happens over and over with with right scenario. Oh, with the with the scenario with the police officer that pulled out the taser instead of instead of their gun. That's been all over the place. Um, if you remember Fruitfield Station, that that happened early in the two thousands. That was the same story there that the person pulled out their gun instead of their taser. And it's like, wait, how do we spend so much money on police training and we expect them to know how to handle a situation and yet a mistake? in air quotes, can happen like this. And um, and yeah, that's just becomes the problem. That becomes, that points to and identifies what the problem is, that the things, those are the things that need to be addressed. So, sorry. And do you think, um, and as Tony was uh, talking about this, and, and I agree, because uh, Phil, you were talking about, like, a lot of times the statements, the words are given, but there's no, there's, there's no, depth to the words because the actions don't ever follow. I think that's uh, uh, what you both are um, pointing to. And because this isn't, as you were saying, Phil, I mean, I, I've seen a number of different former police chiefs on TV lately talking about how they've done uh, significant adaptions to the tasers and the coloring of the tasers to, to identify between a taser and a the handgun and that they're on both sides. And the question is, is that's great if the training, though, isn't appropriate to get because it's like telling a doctor, look, we made the scalpel different than the clamps. But if the doctor doesn't know what they're supposed to be doing in the surgery, whether to grab the clamps or the the, the scalpel, what does it matter? Because they've never been properly trained, even if you give them the scalpel, and they don't know how to do it, because let's say they have not been trained to. And I don't even know if it's the training with the the guns or the tasers or the batons but training in a time of crisis is what it seems like because these cops and i don't know i've never been in this situation and i think that's where i wonder are the dialogues even happening because what if there's a number of police who are saying hey look i want to be a police officer but we are not taught crisis management you know and so they don't speak up because in going back to the 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 deficiency of the cross Tony, Christianity presents a Messiah, a cross that's empty, and it's victorious in their, the, the evangelical realm, which means that weakness is always meant to be uh, weeded out. So as a cop, which you're supposed to be the blue field, you know, force field, right? The, the blue shield, like this is strength in its power, because this is what we need for those who are protecting us. Well, if that's continually baked into the training, which one of the cops is ever going to stand up and say, hey, I don't know, like, I'm not sure, or I'm concerned in crisis. So they're not even having the dialogue because, again, I think it goes back to the, a, a deeper meaning or, or reason, which stems from the emptiness of the cross today. In today's culture, um, Leslie Newbegin writes in a book about uh, uh, faith and doubt uh, about that today's uh, culture is trying to get rid of religion and that's the downfall of any culture is that without any religion he's saying religion in general because with the religion there's an acknowledgement of an absolute and that absolute is beyond the human so going back to augustine um when he said that faith seeking understanding and in the 15th century you know descartes comes and says i think therefore i am the objectivity of faith is switched out for the subjectivity of the human such that we then become the God, you know, and so which one of us would put ourselves on the cross? The best kind of cross for me is an empty cross because that means that I don't need to get up there, right? So last week when you were saying, Tony, uh, we're not supposed to live vicariously, but interdependently, right? There's this perichoretic, there's this truth of us interpenetrating each other's lives. I wonder, though, Tony, if the vicariousness, though, is something we must be pushing for, because the, the, the commandment says to love the Lord your God, right, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, what if I'm so vicariously living through you, Tony, that all I want is for the goodness of your life, the truth, the beauty, and the goodness of who you are to be elevated? So I live so much through you because it's as if I'm living out my own goodness through you, whether that's vicariousness or that's the truth of interdependent interdependence, you know, perichoritic truth. The point is, is that our lives are so deeply interwoven 
because I want to stretch. I want to press back on last week. We were talking about, I can't ever live as a black man or as a brown man or as a black woman or as a, as a trans, you know, a, 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 a gay man in the suburban, you know, even if he's white, right. Cause that's just not my life, but how does empathy and suffering with, you know, that compassion, because compassion has that con, con there in the beginning, the co, and you said this, suffer with, right? How does that happen, though? How do I learn how to suffer on your behalf if we're somewhat stepping back and saying, I can't vicariously do that? Like, I can never step into your skin. But how do we do that? And I mentioned last week, somehow or another, the spirit and Christ work through that because your suffering can never be my suffering, right, Tony? Because I never going to walk down the road you know, in the car, if I have a, um, a freshener, you're, I bet that if we all go to Vegas and we could probably put down a fairly large bet, if I'm driving with a freshener in Minnesota and Phil's driving, there is a high percentage that he will get pulled over and I won't. Right. So I won't ever, but how do I then learn how to suffer with him if I can't ever truly step into their skin? You know, so how do we play this out though? How do we play this out to where I understand your reality? Cause if, if you tell me I can't, then why would I try, right? You know, so how do we do this though? Yeah, I, I think it starts with us um, taking somebody at their word. And like, of course it gets uh, more nuanced the, the further we go along the journey. But I think when somebody tells us they're hurting, we take them at their word rather than trying to disprove it or um, find statistics for why uh, their experience is localized to just them or subjective to only just to them. Um, I think that's how empathy and um, compassion works. Um, I think the irony in all of this is like uh, we can throw as many statistics out there as we want, but sometimes um, rationalism and logic is only a um like a really blunt screwdriver in everybody's hand and we just use it as a bludgeoning tool like uh to keep people at a distance and not to acknowledge their hurt um like we get throw stats out like when's the last time we saw protests against the fire department like when was the last time you know the fire department rolled up to a burning house and then uh they didn't put that house out but they actually lit all the surrounding houses on fire and then they rolled out and then they're like oh i need uh some time away because of the trauma from the job you know i burned down some houses and now i need you know uh some therapy for that like i just we we never hear protests for that um i was re i i received some crisis training from a police officer and uh, they're talking about how whenever they enter a um, situation, they acknowledge that uh, they are, it, though a weapon may not be present on the suspect, they are escalating the situation because they're bringing a weapon to the situation. That by bringing their gun, they are, uh, by their presence, applying deadly force just by having the gun present. And to me, that's like, how warped is that? That, that does that not indicate that there can be no um, de-escalation training? Because if uh, from a uh, police officer's perspective, whenever they walk into a scene of crisis, that they are some way or another passively escalating it because of their firearm, that means the system is inherently broken. How do you reform that? How do you reform a hundred percent introduction of violence by the presence of a firearm. Um, and so I think we, we could talk about logic. We can talk about the statistics like that. That convinces nobody. If anything, that only further entrenches everybody into their silos, into their echo chambers, into their camps. I think when when we take somebody at their word for their experience, that's when we begin to uh, move the needle towards making um, real substantive change. But then it, it gets complicated because of power dynamics, because whose experience is uh, more real than uh, 
than others. And so when we look at the biblical narrative, Jesus has preferential treatment. When um, the Samaritan woman tells him this is her experience, we, we don't see Jesus going, well, you know, you're a sinner and all those Pharisees are probably right about you because they have some truth too. Um, I think when we start not only, uh, when we start rehabilitating our humanity and we begin to look at people who have addictions to drugs, people who have um, a struggle with houselessness, like we begin to see them as human. Like their struggle is not a ding on the inherent worth of their humanity. But so often in our system, political economic system, we think that morally there's something wrong with them because of what they struggle with. But could we imagine Jesus doing that to somebody in uh, his time? Some like, uh, if the woman who bled for 12 years under the uh, understanding of those religious uh, leaders saying, oh, she's bleeding because she's a sinner, like God has cursed her. Could you imagine if Jesus said like, you know, they have some truth, like that, this has been the long held belief that God has cursed you. And so this physical ailment you have, well, tough luck. I think God gives preference, I believe that God gives preferential treatment to the poor, to the oppressed, to the marginalized, regardless of what their morality is. Like, full stop. I, I, I don't think God's compassion is like, you have to be a quote unquote good person for God to love you. I think we impose that on God. And sure. So, yeah. So would yeah. You, hey, would you push back? I mean, would you um, say though, and I'm curious with you too, Phil, uh, because you both mentioned uh, reactions to the um, the guilty verdict. Would you say the same thing about our reactions then for the need for justice in death penalty? Would you say that the killing of another because they took a life doesn't seem to solve the issue? So if we're going to do systemic um, adjustments, reform within the system, we have to reform also the consequences of someone's actions. I mean, would you go that far as well to say that, meaning we can't celebrate the ver the guilty verdict if it leads to another person's death, because that doesn't solve issues as to the elevation of the human, because all that says is you've done one thing bad, now you're in the bad box, and so your life is now unworthy or unvalued, you know, non-valuable. I mean, would, would that be a fair also to say, Hey, look, if I'm going to uh, protest the treatment of George Floyd, I also have to protest the, or, or maybe I should at least think about the protest of what we do to the criminal, you know, the people who perpetuate violence. Like, are we though perpetuating a system that this is, it's the Ouroboros, right? We're just eating our own tail. We have, we raise up uh, folks who are caught in a system so where they get uh, stuck in the, 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 the criminal culture. And then we have people who are supposed to curtail the criminal culture, but then they are given, you know, almost a license. Like you were saying, Phil, like certain actions in their job, if it was another job, you wouldn't have that job anymore, right? But it seems like within the policing right now, um, there's, you know, however, the consequences of what happens to them and even uh, uh, other offenders. I mean, part of the issue with Dante Wright was a, a past uh, um, conviction, you know, or a past uh, uh, issue that had. So the, the whole system, though, we can't just look in. I, I wonder if the problem is, is we just look so individually that then how can you not somewhat celebrate because everyone, I mean, I think if we're honest, everyone's holding their breath because based on a history, 25 years ago, there were police officers who beat the crap out of a black man in LA and it was on tape and we see them going, nothing, right? You know, and so, and, but then we saw the consequences of that too with the, the beating of that truck driver, you know, in the streets of LA. What has changed in 25 years? So I think that's where everyone was holding their breath last. But is it a victory? And what is a victory in all of this? 
right? So would you say also that we have to have a more of a, an expanded dialogue with the consequences of this whole situation, the way we treat one another, not just uh, within the police force, not just within the prison reform, but just in general, you know, human to human. Yeah, a couple of things, a couple of things to that, Matt. <clears throat> First off, um, one of the things that we want to do in any of these cases is we want to identify the bad guy. Who was the bad guy in this situation? So it, we can say, all right, George Floyd was the bad guy. So Derek Chauvin did what he did. And in light of our protests and everything, the police became the bad guy. George Floyd was the good guy. And we put one person on one side, one person on the other side. It's much more complex than that. Think about this. This is one of the things I was thinking about all week is how could the situation with George Floyd have played out any differently, okay? So say if a bystander just got fed up, knocked Derek Chauvin over, got him off of George Floyd, what would have been the consequence of that whole situation? The police around him would have turned their attention to the bystander and there's a good chance that we could have had the bystander gunned down right there or something else happening to the bystander. Now say if one of the police officers that was standing alongside pushing back the crowd said, all right, Derek, come on, man. All right, you gotta get off, come on, come on, we're done, we're done here. And pushed him. That police officer may have lost his job or would have been so out of pocket for what he was doing that he probably couldn't go back to his job. And this whole situation what we would have had is in the end, George, Derek Chauvin didn't have, wouldn't have murdered George Floyd there but then would have potentially been able to murder him again, murder someone else in the same city doing something else with the things that were going on in his head. So all these kind of situations, we try to identify the bad guy, but it's just, I don't even know if there's a bad guy here. So I don't even know if there's ever gonna be a winner here. We're all losers when it comes to this regard. But the same token, identifying and knowing that the evil is deeper than that. The evil is being able to look at another person and dehumanize that person and say that this person is a bad guy. Identifying that evil first off, that's where the training needs to be. That's where the church speaks into this because we know that the bad guy is not the individual, that, that the hero in the situation is not the individual, but there's an evil that's growing there that needs to be stamped out. And that evil connects to sin. It plays out differently in different situations, but that evil plays out differently. And the church is the one that speaks to things like that, that allows us to approach situations and identify this is the actual evil. This is, for me, when I think of Martin Luther King, that's what I think. When he was trying to stamp out the evil, but main dignity between oppressed and oppressor and saying, we need to develop brotherhood and friendship in this. Now, most of us looking at that says, King, you're crazy. But that's the thing he's looking at. He's saying, let's identify the evil, let's smash out the evil because that will change the perspective of this entire situation. And that will be what real change looks like. Other than that, we're just kind of doing particular things that leans one way or the other and says, okay, we did a good job because we stamped out the bad guy when year after year, or in that scenario situation, the bad guy is not just one person or one thing, so. For me, I would say, um, yeah, I think we need to abolish the death penalty. I don't think uh, um, as humans, as creatures, we have the right to decide who lives and who dies. Um, that uh, God is the one who gives life and takes away life. So we do not have that authority. Um, I think... Uh, that the death penalty is just another indicator of our uh, diseased uh, system of justice. Um, I think because uh, well, I think the difficult part of um, talking about law enforcement and police officers is some people will feel that I, I go after police officers so hard but I think what's hard about it is what like why do we hold our like um the people who should be upholding justice commit injustice and then we have to retroactively like hold them accountable we have to retroactively go okay you shouldn't have done that 
and then the system continues. Um, and to, to Phil's point of like, it's not just the individual, like Derek is as much a victim of the policing system and a participant of the policing system as as George Floyd is a victim of the policing system. And I'm not saying like Derek Chauvin, like I'm not trying to reform his um, his actions. I'm not trying to reform what I believe is a um, an unreformable police system. What I'm saying is I don't want us to uh, use the death of George Floyd to uh, enjoy dehumanizing another person. I think that's what we're all talking about. And so as much as I, I like go hard at our law enforcement um, and, and our justice system, I am not looking to dehumanize somebody um, because I think by doing so, I dehumanize myself um, and the system that they are participating already dehumanizes them it are, and it dehumanizes others. So, uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah I, I, one, I think top down, we, we need to do away with death penalty. And then it's incremental changes. When we no longer view our justice that we get to deal out as being able to decide between life and death, I think that begins to rehabilitate it um, and reform it. When death is no longer a avenue for justice, I think that's what, because Jesus has already paid it. Like we can't keep talking about like, oh, Jesus did it once and for all. Just kidding. We still need to kill a bunch of other dudes to make sure that justice is met out. Uh, I just, yeah, I have a hard time with that. Yeah, and I think in addition to what you're saying, Tony, um, <clears throat> when, when we think that some people aren't redeemable for whatever reason, and now we put that we put that on other people. <laughs> it's not Jesus putting that on other people. We put that on people, thinking they're unredeemable. Therefore, they need to stay in jail forever, or this person deserves to die because they've done this horrific thing. And understanding that, yeah, you know, Jesus Christ can change and redeem anyone's life. And you know, the reason why he had to do that is because we were all the bad guy, and he had to <laughs> he had to come and be the hero in the story to redeem us. And because we're in that state of being redeemed, we understand that redemption can happen in any other facet and the power of the cross can meet it there and reform that particular individual. Our system of justice is based on what we've been talking about, retribution. Finding the bad guy, penalizing the bad guy for doing the wrong that he did or she did. Well, that's not the scenario. That person can be redeemed. That person can be redeemed. If we don't come to the perspective, come to that, I mean, then say that's because, I mean, I work in recovery. I work with men that in many regards, people would say this person needs to be put under the jail and never ever released for some of the things that we've seen them do. I say, no, mm -hmm. they can be redeemed. And there's so many stories of those kind of men that come, come out of the place where I work and they're totally different people. And, you, and working with them every day, I see the change happening in their lives. And the more I've seen that change, the more I can say that change can happen anywhere else. And the more I say, some of this change needs to happen within the walls of our churches. All right, let me leave that alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so going to your point, Phil, in uh, this idea of rehabilitation, um, and then connecting that to your point, Tony, about um, trusting what people say is true. Like, um, don't you think we have to do that first with God that trust God and what he says is true, that he says he is the redeemer. He is the healer. He is the reconciler, but that he's not doing that now on his own. You know, second Corinthians five talks about uh, in the very end where it says, you know, uh, Christ, uh, Paul's telling the church that Christ became sin so that you could become not sin, but the righteousness of God, right? And so Bonhoeffer, when he talks about in his ethics about uh, pushing this idea of becoming more human, he's really drawing from Bart and the idea of uh, Christ was the ultimate human, right? The most human of human. 
And so we need to be willing to, to become so human. And Bonhoeffer steps into like kind of justifying like doing worldly things, you know, sin. I think maybe he didn't take it far enough. Jesus became sin so that we could become the most human, which is what? To participate in the worldly things with one another, regardless of that's in the whorehouse or in the 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 the, the ghetto or in the gambling uh, um, uh, 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 slot machines, you know, the the casino, whatever, wherever we might think that uh, sin lurks, which is everywhere, right? And so to take Bonhoeffer and saying that we need to become more human, more worldly, is what Bart said, more worldly than the world, maybe. Unless, of course, uh, it, it, as long as that world cosmos understands that it's created in the image of God, so as to become more worldly, would become more of what Christ created us to be. He became sin, so we could become righteousness of God. You know, that's our baptism into that. And so, if we are to trust one another, when you tell me that you're suffering, when you tell me that you've had oppression, and I trust you. Can that only happen, though, if first and foremost, I have trusted the Lord my God so that all that we're talking about, your truth and my truth, can only be understood because like you were saying, Tony, truth is relative, relative to Jesus. So Jesus is the objective truth of the Godhead. The Spirit comes and makes that truth real to me. So it's somewhat relative because it's relative to me, Matt Farlow. However, it's always objective because it's always connected in Christ. That's the in Christness. This is why the church is so, so crucially important to society. Always has been, right? This is why New Wine pushes not about New Wine, not about you, Tony, or you, Phil, or me, uh, Matt Farlow. It's about Christ, in Christ through the Spirit. So isn't that trust, though, what we need to continue to remind people within the church is the trust happens with us and our Lord, and then with one another so that the world can see, oh, humans can actually get together. They can actually love one another without, then we wouldn't need a justice system. I wonder sometimes when we start talking about this reparations, everything, because we live in such a re retributive, uh, retributive uh, kind of culture, anyone who hears reparations, they hear retributions because they're like, holy crap, well, we did bad. We were whatever, punishing or pushing down the people that we supposedly thought were the bad guy. Now there's a shift and they're switching it to where we're the bad guy and they're the good guy. It goes back to, and April 23rd is recognized as the birth of, of Shakespeare. And he says what? It's not, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So each age has what is right and what is wrong, right? We, we determine it. That goes back to what you're saying, Tony, that allows for truth to be relative and it will always remain on a sliding scale if Christ isn't in the mix. How does that continue? Like, but how do we get the, does the church even believe that today? Like when we talk about perpetuating Good Friday, are there a lot of people in the church saying, what are you talking about? The cross is empty, man. Victory, victory, because he's the good guy. He's the hero. We need a hero. It's why the Marvel comics and all that stuff, those, those movies grow so much because we're looking for a hero. But Jesus wasn't a hero. He didn't come to be a hero in the sense of what the world says is a hero, right? Suffering hero is an oxymoron. How does the church step into the truth, though, to, to where this is the God that we worship, not the God that we have created? Yeah, this is a such a centuries-long problem because... Um, we look at how the Western church has so united itself to understandings of what a nation is and what a country is, what is political and governmental authority. Um, if I were to choose one thread to pull on, it would be um, the thread of private property. And, and it's offensive to people be, and this does this makes people uncomfortable because this is the environment we're raised in. Um, this is the air we breathe and the water we swim in. But our understanding of private property, as if private property is a given right. But if we go back not so far, and we understand that uh, black people were viewed as private property. So we're talking about people here, people made in the image of God, viewing private property. 
being viewed as private property. That view infects every other view of what private property is. And then, so we see that how that is connected to our law enforcement agencies, because that stems from slave patrols, the recovery of private property. And, 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 and then, so the church is the Western church actively participates and if not is one of the largest proprietors of private property. When we look at the history of the American church, there are churches that were not able to um, pay their pastors. So the church got together as a congregation and bought a slave as compensation for the pastor. The American church is uh, actively participating in uh, um, systemic injustice. And it is a benefactor of systemic injustice. And that's just because we're talking about private property here. It, it is so much more endemic and so much more, um, uh, it, it, the problem has infiltrated our entire way of being, our, our entire um, existence. And so that's why the work is so arduous. Um, and it's why people have such strong opinions because we have to change the way we live entirely for true justice to be available to all of us. Um, and it's hard because we say we're Christians and we follow Jesus and we have a hard time realizing that, um, that as the church, when we should have been moving for justice, we, we actually are actively participating and perpetuating injustice. Like the Grenwald painting that uh, Bart famously has on an uh, altarpiece in front of his desk, where it's Jesus on the cross and it's John the Baptist with the pointy finger. And um, Bart uses that imagery as a witness of like, John the Baptist is the witness. And the pastor needs to be like John the Baptist. Um, on one hand, pointing uh, to the crucifixion and on the other, uh, holding the text of the strange new world. I wonder for us though, if, if uh, the American church has lost to any right to be prophetic and we're just straight pathetic. And what John the Baptist is showing us is that we've put Jesus on the cross that it's now a no longer a word of a proclamation, but it's a condemnation. It's that we no longer have any right to participate in this ministry of proclamation because we defile the crucifixion. And that pointy finger that John the Baptist has that points to the cross, we are not John the Baptist, we are not Mary and the beloved disciple, we are the centurion that actively um, uh, mocks and jeers at the crucifixion. And so I just, I, I want to follow Jesus so faithfully, but I, I know that, uh, yeah, I need to start with myself. If, if I have any claim to evangelicalism, I need to start here before I, I even move out for myself. Yeah, that's real talk, Tony. I guess that's a, I know there's a one. One of our friends we were talking, I was talking to over text a little while ago. He said, we haven't talked for a little while. He's like, I don't know if I'm Christian anymore. Like, this <laughs> partly because what we live into through our Christian experience in this country is so far off. I, I continue to use the analogy that if Jesus walks into one of our churches, are we at all being faithful? Can the American church as it stands now with all our divisions of it and the like, can any of those things be something that truly proclaims a true gospel? Because, and I say that because I don't know if we live it out at all in whatever iteration, I don't know if we live it out at all, but that becomes the consequence just where you landed, Tony, where we got to start here. Am I holding true to how I understand the scriptures? Am I understanding you know, what the gospel points to? Am I actually living into that reality day in and day out? It's a consistent struggle that is just as daunting as 
looking at race in America. It's, it's just as daunting because I don't know if we can live in, I don't know if we know how to live into it, but we really just need to start over and figure out what it is. What is the gospel? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And reframing all those notions to kind of forget the kind of American stuff we've put on top of it. So there it is. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Um, these are conversations that are going on all the time. And uh, throughout the church, we need them to be going on further uh, and even deeper as to what does it mean to be Jesus in the 21st century, right? And um, each each age has to ask itself its question is, are we the church in this 21st century? Are we, you know, in, in whatever, every 10 years, every generation, I guess, has to look and say, are we following the truth of the spirit in this age? Because each age, like our language has to be uh, understood. Our culture has to be understood because the way in which you talk to folks in the 21st century about race in 2021 is different than it was in 1960. And we continue to have these conversations with the, the sexual exploitation and things. Oh, that's the way it was then, you know, great. But this is now, right? And so we need the church to step in and see, well, where is Jesus today? Yeah. What would he be doing? You know, uh, I I kind of wonder if each age has to really step into that position where Jesus says, "Take tear this temple down and I will raise it up. So each age, we have to burn it down. We have to burn down, tear down the temple that was created by human hands in this age, in this culture, right? But in order to do that, in order to rebuild it, it's the spirit working through us. There's cooperation so that we're neighbors, right? Neighbors work together to build, you know, to create and to participate with the Godhead. Um, and that's seeing you as my neighbor. And I know uh, Metzger has been pushing on this and we have where we've gotten... It's good to see the other, but we've gotten so dis distant that now the other becomes so distant that they become exactly what you were talking about, Tony. They are dehumanized. So instead of talking about the other as a person, we're using other as just another commodity, something to buy and sell. And exact going back to slave mentality, we are enslaving ourselves, you know, which is biblical. The Bible talks about us enslaving ourselves continually. You know, Paul talks about that, that which I do not want to do, I do. Is the church then, though, not uh, uh, illuminating the goodness of the gospel, and thus we are left to focus on the things that we deem good and bad? You know, like Shakespeare says, it's our thinking in the 21st century such that we are in search of the good and we are in search of the bad person, highlighting so that we can feel better about ourselves, right? This is the continual conversation. This is why New Wine presses so much into Christ-centered, spirit-led, because if it's left in my hands, if it's left in Tony's or Phil's together, guess what? We're going to mess it up. We're going to mess it up. We need Jesus and we need the spirit moving. And we're going to continue with this conversation. We're so stoked that you joined us uh, today for another episode of New Wine Uncorked. As always, if you go right up to the right hand because you're watching this on YouTube, there's that subscribe button. Um, actually, it's right below the video. On the upper right hand is if you jump, uh, go on over after this and go to the New Wine Facebook page and then just hit like. And that way you'll be um, informed with all the things that New Wine's doing because this is something... That's not just a dialogue for Tony or Phil and I. This is life, learning how the Spirit is calling us to be active participants in what God is doing here and now as we seek to live out thy will be done on earth that is in heaven. So on behalf of Phil and Tony, I'm Matt, and we're stoked that you joined us for another episode of New Wine Uncorked. Until the next time, we'll see you on the flip side. Have a good one.